Gardner and Alka, you know, jo you know, Joseph Gerson and Michael Clare are the two co-directors or co-presidents of, of the uh, same, same US uh, China policy organization. And they claim that I volunteered to be the moderator for this, but it's not true. <laughs> but it isn't true? It's not true, no. Okay. no. That appears to be a beautiful tanka in the background, Paul. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, my job has been wonderful and being able to travel different parts of the world. And uh, Joe Gerson and I have a little comparison of the art that we've picked up along the way. It's nice. All right, I think we should uh, start and uh, allow others to join as they can. Uh, I can't see everybody, but I do want to extend a, uh, a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us for this webinar titled The Uyghurs, Who They Are, Human Rights Abuses and Implications for US Policy. Um, we, um, my name is Paul Joseph. Um, I'm serving as moderator today, and I'm a professor of sociology at Tufts University. Um, this webinar has been organized by the Committee for a Sane U.S.-China Policy, which is a non-governmental organization, a, a peace and justice organization that is greatly concerned with the growing level of hostility between the United States and China and is devoted to discussing issues and trying to develop steps to reduce that hostility and improve the chances for, um, to improve the chances for peace. Um, our topic today is an exploration of the, of the Uyghurs and we're looking at a situation in which there are widespread, credible reports of uh, brutal repression of this minority and even claims of genocide um, of the Uyghur Muslim population. And these reports are very concerning and they should not be ignored by any stretch of the imagination. At the same time, we're also concerned and very aware that this issue has been part of the deteriorating relations between the United States and China. And, um, in that it's been battered around and used as a crux and as part of the deepening of hostilities. And we wanna to try to be very concerned about that. We wanna avoid a double standard, um, but we also want to discuss this in a way that allows us to chart a way forward, um, to see the situation clearly, and also to see the situation in a way that could diminish hostilities, lower the temperature and allow us to take steps that could actually improve the situation, both for Uyghurs and for the overall relationship between the United States and China. And that's a real challenge, uh, but we are greatly assisted in that project by our three wonderful panelists today. Um, I'll introduce them briefly and then go over a bit of the ground rules here. Uh, we are joined by Gardner Bovington, who is an associate professor at Indiana University of Central Eurasian Studies. And Gardner is also the author of The Uyghurs, Strangers in Their Own Lands. And over his shoulder, you'll see a wonderful set of maps, unusual set of maps, and maybe we'll be able to draw on those as well. Second, we have Alkin Akkad, who is a China specialist at Amnesty International and has been based uh, recently in Hong Kong. He's had a lot of experience in traveling in mainland China and in Hong Kong. But unfortunately, that office recently had to close and he's now based in London. 
And then finally, we have with us Kate Kaiser, who is a human rights advocate, a columnist for the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, and most recently, the policy director for Win Without War. Um, taken together, we have a wonderful group of expertise, and I'm really looking forward to their presentations. Kate, unfortunately, has to leave at five, so I'm just going to put an asterisk on that, and we'll probably return um, to give her the first opportunity to answer questions after the initial presentations. So I've asked our panelists to each contribute 15 minutes, uh, starting with Gardner, then moving to Elkin, and then going to Kate. And as they talk, uh, we welcome uh, questions from you. And if you could post those, if you look on the bottom of your screen in the button Q and A, and just enter your questions there, um, uh, we'll be monitoring those and we'll ask our panelists those, you have an opportunity to answer those questions as well. So um, let's just go right into it um, without any further delay. Gardner, we're looking for you first for an overview. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for that introduction, setting the context and the ground rules. Thanks to Joseph and Michael for the original invitation. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be on this panel with these distinguished fellow panelists. Uh, and I also want to say it's a great pleasure to be able to talk about this very difficult and sensitive subject in a free society. I hope that the people who are attending will avail themselves of the opportunity to ask questions and make points. It is one of the virtues of living in a society where there is freedom of speech, which there is not in the place we're gonna talk about. So uh, as Paul mentioned, I published a book on the politics in modern Xinjiang as it's called in Chinese or East Turkestan as Uyghurs call it, uh, published in 2010. My field work was conducted mostly in the 1990s and the 2000s. I've not been able to travel to Xinjiang in many years. So I depend in part on the findings of experts such as the people on this panel and other scholars uh, for information about what's happened recently. So my role here is to sort of set up the context, the context from which the horrible situation of the camps and the, uh, the modern surveillance state emerged. And I'm gonna try to do that succinctly. Uh, as Paul said, we've been given 15 minutes each. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of topics very briefly and I'll be happy to talk about any of them or elaborate on them uh, in the Q&A period. So, the place we are calling Xinjiang or East Turkestan was founded as a so-called autonomous region of the People's Republic in 1955. Uh, it is one of five such regions in the country. The term autonomy indicates a recognition by the Communist Party at that time that culturally distinct peoples living together in large numbers, such as Uyghurs there, Tibetans in Tibet, uh, Mongolians in Inner Mongolia, and so on, were sufficiently different and had uh, enough distinct political history in the past that they merited recognition and a system that supposedly granted them autonomy. In fact, it has never given very much political autonomy at all, and that's always been a problem. But some of the principal features have included uh, a constitutionally guaranteed right to use one's own language. So for Uyghurs, that would be Uyghurs. For Kazakhs, in, also in the camps, that would be Kazakh and so forth. Uh, and though the party is officially atheist, the constitution also guaranteed a right to freedom of religious belief, which the party and I will hasten to point out is not the same thing as religious freedom. So it means the right to believe and the right not to believe, although certain groups have not really enjoyed the right to believe. The population of Xinjiang was about three quarters Uyghur uh, and probably close to 85% Muslim uh, in 1949. Uh, so Uyghurs and Kazakhs and others in the camps we're all talking about are Muslims and they are speakers of Turkic languages, which are completely unlike Chinese, they're in a different language family. Uh, the Chinese population there was quite small, only a few hundred thousand. In the 1950s and 60s, hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions of Hans moved to the region. Uh, this was very clearly a process of colonization, although the party denied it at the time, continues to deny it, but the evidence is unmistakable. And the intention was to make the region more secure. So many of the Hans that were brought into the region and set up on paramilitary farms, especially in the borderlands, um, part of the purpose 
was to settle the region, to settle the borderlands with politically reliable population, populations. Um, there were also large numbers of migrants brought to the major cities of Xinjiang, starting with the capital city of Urumuchi um, and some cities to the north of the Tian Shan Mountains, and more recently to the south, although the process of immigration and the tools for it have changed over time. But it's important to note that the massive influx of Han Chinese changed the demography of the region, it changed the culture of the region dramatically, and it increasingly uh, made clear the party's intention to, as the term is often said, sinify the region and make Uyghurs and other speakers of non-Chinese languages feel increasingly the need to learn Chinese as part of their apparatus for daily life. I mentioned before that the region was set up as an autonomous region, like the other four uh, major provincial level units in China. And I also mentioned that that autonomy was sharply circumscribed. Uh, if there was some degree of autonomy in the 1950s, uh, relative freedom to speak local languages, to practice religion and so forth, the 1960s and early 70s in the Cultural Revolution saw um, much less tolerance for diversity, much more pressure on populations to become atheists, to cease to practice uh, in any public way their religion, um, and increasingly to conform to the political expectations of an extremely rigid um, Mao-centered party. It is widely understood that the Cultural Revolution um, in put many people in conditions of terror. It led many Uyghurs and other non-Hans to feel quite alienated from the party and from the Han population. And so after the end of the Cultural Revolution in the late 1970s, the party decided to retrench some of the really the policies hostile to diversity in order to try to win back the loyalty of Uyghurs and Kazakhs and Xinjiang, Tibetans in Tibet and so on. So there was modest opening for people to begin to practice their religion again, many, many mosques, 10, several 20,000 mosques really were closed during the Cultural Revolution. Many of them were opened, some that had been destroyed were renovated, some new ones were built, and people began cautiously to practice Islam again, to um, study the Quran if they could get their hands on one and so forth. And there was a return to free speech and, sorry, more open speech and more open publication. Uh, in Uyghur and these other languages. I would not say free, it was always closely policed, but the period of the 1980s in retrospect looks to Uyghurs and Kazakhs and other like a period in which comparative autonomy, freedom to um, talk about historical topics and other things was modestly provided. Um, but starting around 1990, there was an episode of violence in Southwest Xinjiang that made party leaders worry that increasing religiosity, increasing feeling of the right to be Uyghur, speak Uyghur, uh, increasing desire not to be under the domination of the Han-controlled Communist Party, um, led to an unstable situation. In 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union put the party on notice. Uh, and the interpretation of many of the high party leaders was, we need now to worry about the consequences of allowing groups as the Soviet Union had to uh, imagine themselves to be culturally distinct, religiously distinct and so forth. Um, and so in the 1990s, there was an out uh, party sponsored countervailing pressure to crack down on increased religiosity, um, to try to force Uyghurs and others to begin to learn Chinese and to integrate themselves into the Chinese mediated economy. Uh, there was also a series of protests, bombings, small scale skirmishes and so forth. There were several major events in 1997. Um, and the atmosphere began to be in a period when I was doing my field work there, much more tense. Uh, there were uh, parades of police marching in the streets. There were trucks carrying police around to show people their presence. Uh, then if I fast forward again to September 11th, um, this of course opened up an international discourse of a global war on terror targeting, unfortunately, Muslims around the world. Beijing adroitly used this opportunity to label Uyghurs not just um, politically unstable, but also possibly indeed likely participants in a global terrorist network, which by the way, um, had 
almost no evidence. There were um, hardly any indications of any, con uh, any connections with global terrorist organizations and so forth. But that then invited what turned out to be a much stronger crackdown on private religious study, on mosque attendance, and on the outward signs of religiosity, such as wearing beards, wearing headscarves, and so forth. Um, 2009 saw a major episode of violence centering Urumqi, July of 2009. Um, unfortunately, in two days of violence, probably 150 Hans killed by Uyghurs, according to reports. The information is still scanty, followed by Han vigilantes uh, going through the streets on July 7th, uh, retaliating and so forth. So 2009 was a very bad year, and the party began to put much more emphasis on trying to take Xinjiang in hand, which include new encouragements for Han immigration to the region, new uh, pressures for uh, Uyghurs and others to learn Chinese, um, increasing pressures on any form of religious expression and so on. If I fast forward again to 2013, 2014, um, where the party had been complaining, warning for years of terrorist activity, um, most of the evidence was scant, if any at all. A lot of the things called terrorism really didn't fit the label. But in the winter of 2013 uh, through the spring of 2014, there were a spate of episodes of real violence um, and uh, large scale killings, including a terrible attack in a Kunming uh, train station, another in a Rumchi train station, uh, a bombing in a market in Rumchi, uh, uh, an SUV loaded with explosives in Beijing. So that year saw even more concern in Beijing. Uh, and within the year, a brand new party secretary was appointed, a guy named Chen Chengguo, who came from Tibet, where he'd installed a new set of policies. These included things like a network of small police stations named Citizens Convenience Stations uh, and all kinds of surveillance apparatus. That system was massively augmented in Xinjiang for a very different political situation, uh, but it is observable in all of the major cities of Xinjiang and many of the, the um, areas in the countryside. These stations um, include gates through which local citizens must pass to move from area to area. area. Um, Hans go right through without any special scrutiny, but Uyghurs and other Muslims are required to submit to facial scans, um, to scans of their phones to make sure they have surveillance software and so forth. And this information is fed into an enormous database that includes information not only about their faces, but about their uh, recorded voices, their blood and DNA and so forth. This is all part of an increasingly augmented surveillance state to keep track of people, to see where they're going, who they associate with, who they have contact with, and so on. And then finally, um, it's very clear that the party secretary decided that this was not enough, and so set up what were initially described as re-education and transformation camps, um, into which more and more Uyghurs and others were thrown, starting in 2016. The best estimates we have now the party has, of course, never provided full numbers, is that there are as many as 1.8 million people, most of them Uyghurs, but also Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and others, in these camps, overwhelmingly without official charges, without official sentences, with no idea of how long it will take for them to be released. In these places, they are given mandatory classes in atheism, they are um, instructed to interrogate themselves to figure out when they became extremist, uh, to confess to this and promise never to do it again, to profess loyalty to the party, um, to learn Chinese, uh, and in all ways to become much more tractable, as many observers would say, to become less and less Uyghur over time. Uh, yes, these camps uh, are unquestionably um, well beyond the pale of any comprehensible uh, legal and juridical structure. As I said, there's no formal sentence uh, and uh, people basically disappear into them. Under international pressure and scrutiny over the last several years, Beijing has set up um, courts and trials for some small number of the people in them so that now there are people in actual prisons with formal charges, but the vast majority of the people in them still exist without knowing how long they'll be there uh, and why. This system of camps has inculcated terror in the hearts 
of the many non-Hans in Xinjiang. And I think this is quite by intention. And it has led both the Turkic Muslims of the region and international observers to conclude that the party has essentially lost patience with the religious and linguistic differences of Uyghurs. Um, the original rationale for setting up the autonomous region I mentioned in 1955 is no longer accepted. And the party essentially wants to be done with Uyghurs as Uyghurs. So in the service of a grand plan to homogenize Uyghurs and be done with their cultural diversity, the party has embarked on a terrible abuse of human rights, a terrible confinement of a large part of the population um, with results that my co-panelists will undoubtedly talk about in their presentations. And I will stop there. I'll be looking forward to any questions about what I've said or to follow up later. Thanks. Gardner, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you stood exactly in the 15 minute time limit. That's wonderful. Um, I would recommend uh, our audience uh, to take a look at the SANE website, SANE US China Policy, all one word, dot org, which is very well organized and has at least uh, an introduction to the various issues involving human rights in China, but also comparison with the United States too, internationally. So um, it's a place to start to look at, at things. Um, on that website, you'll also see a reference to the Amnesty International report, and we're pleased to have Alkan Akkad join us too for a more detailed discussion of that. Alkan. Thank you, Paul. Also, thanks, Gardner, uh, for the very concise and helpful background. Um, I'll be uh, speaking mostly about what, where Gardner uh, has left, uh, about the details of uh, what has been happening in these uh, so-called uh, re-education centers uh, and vocational training centers. Uh, based on uh, our, our recent report uh, on Xinjiang. Uh, so we, as uh, Gardner mentioned, uh, since 2017, uh, under the guise of campaign against terrorism, the government of China has carried out uh, massive systematic abuses uh, against Muslims living in Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, far from a legitimate response to the purported terrorist threat, the government's campaign uh, evinces a clear intent to target parts of Xinjiang's population uh, collectively on the basis of religion and ethnicity and to use severe violence and intimidation to root out basically uh, Islamic religious beliefs and Turkic uh, Muslim ethno-cultural practices. Um, the government uh, aims to replace these beliefs and uh, practices with secular state-sanctioned views and behaviors, and ultimately uh, to forcibly assimilate members of these ethnic groups into homogeneous Chinese nation uh, possessing a, a unified language, culture, and perhaps most importantly, uh, an unwavering loyalty uh, to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, to achieve this political indoctrination and forced uh, cultural assimilation, uh, the government undertook a campaign of arbitrary mass detention. Uh, huge numbers of men and women uh, from these ethnic groups have been detained uh, they include uh, perhaps uh, uh, thousands of hun uh, hundreds of thousands who have been imprisoned, as well as hundreds of thousands, perhaps one million or more, uh, who have been sent to these uh, what the government uh, refers to as training or education centers. But these facilities are more accurately described as uh, internment camps. Uh, these uh, detainees in these uh, camps are subjected to ceaseless indoctrination campaign as well as physical, psychological, and other forms of ill treatment. Uh, the internment camp system is part of a much larger campaign of subjugation uh, and forced assimilation of ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. Uh, the Chinese government has enacted 
uh, other far-reaching policies that severely restrict the behaviors of Muslims in the region. Uh, these policies violate uh, multiple human rights, uh, including rights to liberty uh, and security of person, to privacy, to freedom of movement, uh, to opinion and thought and uh, religion and belief, uh, in, to participate in cultural life and to equality and uh, non-discrimination. Uh, these violations are carried out in a, such a widespread and systematic manner that they are now an inexorable uh, aspect of daily life of, for millions of uh, members of uh, these predominantly Turkic Muslim ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. Uh, the Chinese government has taken extreme measures to prevent accurate information about the situation in Xinjiang from being documented uh, and finding reliable information about life inside these uh, internment camps uh, is particularly difficult. Last two years, we interviewed dozens of former detainees and other people who were present in Xinjiang since 2017, uh, most of whom like, uh, had never spoken publicly uh, about their experiences before. Uh, the evidence Amnesty International has gathered uh, provides a factual basis for the conclusion that the Chinese government has committed uh, at least the crimes of uh, crimes against humanity of uh, imprisonment or other severe deprivation of physical liberty in violation of fun fundamental rules of international law torture and persecution. Uh, we interviewed 55 people who had been detained in internment camps um, and later released. All of them had been arbitrarily detained for what appears to be, by all reasonable standards, entirely lawful conduct, uh, even within the Chinese law, most of the times, as Gardner mentioned, uh, without uh, having committed any internationally recognized criminal uh, offense. Uh, the internment camp detention process appears to be also mainly, mostly uh, operating uh, outside the scope of the criminal justice or other domestic law. According to government documents and statements by government officials, uh, applying criminal procedure to, uh, to this would not be appropriate because uh, they are saying these people are staying in these facilities voluntarily, uh, quote unquote, uh, and uh, they have not committed any crimes. Uh, they have just made some uh, mistakes, but uh, nobody, most of the detainees have not been told what their mistakes were. Uh, as like we demonstrated in the details in the report, uh, through the testimonies and other evidence, uh, attendance in these camps are not voluntary at all. And the conditions in, in the camps are an affront to human dignity. Individuals we interviewed said the reasons uh, they were given for their detention were often not tied to any specific acts. Rather, they were told that uh, they had been classified as suspicious untrustworthy terrorists, uh, separatists, or extremists. When specific acts uh, were mentioned, uh, they mainly fall into a few categories. Uh, one of them includes uh, relating to foreign countries. Uh, numerous of them told us that if uh, uh, they were sent to camps because of traveling or studying or living abroad or for like even simply communicating with people abroad uh, or being connected to these people, somehow having some kind of uh, communication with these people who had been living abroad or communicating with people abroad. Uh, another category includes those detained for offenses related uh, to using unauthorized uh, software or digital communications technology, especially on their mobile phones. Uh, mainly uh, encrypted messaging uh, applications, such as even like uh, WhatsApp. 
And uh, another common category uh, includes anything related to religion. They were sent to camps for reasons related to Islamic uh, beliefs or practice, including working in a mosque or praying, uh, having a prayer mat, having a beard or uh, possessing a picture or video uh, with a religious team or a religious uh, prominent figure. Uh, the testimonial evidence we have gathered uh, demonstrated that the members of uh, these ethnic uh, minorities in Xinjiang uh, were often detained on the basis of uh, what can only be considered as uh, guilt by association. Uh, many many of them uh, were interned as a result of their relationship or perceived or alleged relationships. Uh, in internment camps, all detainees were subjected to ceaseless indoctrination campaign, as well as physical and uh, psychological torture and other forms of ill treatment. From the moment they enter a camp, uh, their lives were extraordinarily regimented. They were split of uh, their personal autonomy, with every aspect of their lives being dictated to them. And those detainees who deviated uh, from the conduct prescribed by the camp authorities, even in most seemingly innocuous uh, ways, were reprimanded and regularly physically uh, punished, often along with their cellmates. Detainees uh, had no privacy. They were monitored at all times, uh, including when they ate, slept, or uh, they used to the toilet. They were forbidden to talk freely with other detainees. Uh, when uh, detainees were permitted to speak to other detainees, guards or teachers, they were required to speak in Mandarin Chinese, a language many of them could not speak or uh, understood, especially if they were older people or those from the rural areas in Xinjiang. Uh, there were also, uh, there was insufficient food, water, exercise, healthcare, sanitary and hygienic conditions, uh, fresh air and exposure to natural light detainees had draconian restrictions uh, placed on their ability to urinate and defecate. All detainees were required to work one or two hours shifts every night, monitoring their cellmates. Uh, many former detainees reported that during the first few days, weeks, or sometimes months after arriving at these camps, they were forced to do nothing but sit still, often in terrible, uncomfortable positions for nearly the entire day. Uh, and uh, I will lastly speak about the torture and uh, other ill treatment. Every former detainee we have interviewed was tortured or subjected to other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment uh, or punishment during their uh, internment. Uh, these uh, treatments, torture, uh, and ill treatment uh, are constitutive elements of life in the internment camps. The torture mainly includes the total loss of control and personal autonomy and other torture uh, that occurs during interrogations or as punishment for misbehaviors uh, by specific detainees. Uh, torture methods used during interrogations and uh, as punishment included uh, beatings, electric shocks, stress positions, uh, the unlawful use of restraints, uh, including being locked to in a tiger chair, which is a iron uh, chair that immobilizes detainees, uh, arms and legs uh, mainly. Sleep deprivation, uh, being hung from a wall, being subjected to extremely cold temperatures and solitary confinement. Usually interrogations last one hour or more. Punishments uh, were often much uh, longer. Uh, former detainees describes like uh, they describe a broadly consistent pattern of treatment of detainees by uh, staff and officials in the camps. Some of these tr treatment reflected patterns of uh, torture and other ill treatment that the Chinese security forces have carried out in Xinjiang and uh, other parts of China. And I leave it uh, at that. Over to you, Paul. Thanks. Okay.
Thank you, Alkin. Um, staying in the time limit is a very sobering report, very um, dismaying to hear um, that, that, uh, that information. Um, so um, just kind of trying to uh, broaden things, our perspective and uh, bring this into a broader geopolitical context. And uh, I think Kate is gonna be able to help us with that as well. Kate. Hi everyone, and thanks to the same committee for having me here. Um, and thank you to my fellow panelists uh, for their remarks. I learned a lot and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and for all of your work documenting uh, this terrible situation. I am not a China specialist. Um, I am actually more of a generalist and I focus on US foreign policy, particularly since the post 9-11 wars um, and the hard security responses that has driven a liberalism in my view um, over the last two decades. And so what we're seeing in Washington right now um, is a trend that was started by the Trump administration to use human rights as a cudgel against its adversaries. Um, these are typically geopolitical adversaries. It's not because that administration was particularly interested in human rights. It actively eschewed human rights, um, refused to call uh, things like uh, the genocide against the Rohingya in Burma a genocide, but it was willing to call the Uyghur crisis a genocide. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to the legal ramifications of those types of designations, but I think it's important to note that there have been international bodies who have found um, systematic evidence of things like cultural genocide against the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. Um, and I think it's important um, to note that a lot of the rhetoric um, and the systems that the Chinese government is using either to actual detain or surveil or just to justify this practice is rooted in the counterterrorism framework that the United States popularized after 9-11 and has very effectively transmitted into the international system where now you see across the United Nation, ostensibly, you know, an organization for international peace and security, you have all of these different counterterrorism committees theoretically focusing on this issue, but largely ignoring the role of human rights abuses, governance failure, climate shocks, and people turning to third parties or to violence. Um, I also think it's important to remember that when gross violations of human rights occur to the degree that they're occurring um, in China right now, that signals a very insecure regime. It's not necessarily, I come from this out from a democracy and governance standpoint, and a secure regime does not lash out against critics who um, represent diversity or different viewpoints, right? We see this with other authoritarian um, states, whether that's Egypt or Israel um, or places like Russia and Venezuela. Um, and in China, over particularly over the Trump administration, but the Biden administration has continued this trend where it has staked out a position of zero sum competition between China and the United States and framed the, the situation that we find ourselves in with the rise of China to be one where only the United States or China can win, fueling and fanning the flames of nationalism in both countries, which not only um, fuels xenophobia, racism, and hate violence here in the United States against people of Asian descent or who appear to be of Asian descent, but it also fuels Chinese nationalism and further solidifies support for the party in ways that they may not otherwise have that support because they are able to show that there is a foreign enemy who is threatening China. Uh, Chinese people's livelihoods. And so obviously we must all band together. This has happened across history. It's happened across contexts. But I think it's important to note that what is happening, just because we are opposed to conflict with China and the United States um, or Cold War binary situation over the next years where military power is the primary concern of the great powers um, in our world, I think it's, it's, this space is very, very important because there's a, a belief in Washington um, that if you aren't for confronting China, restraining China, then you're an apologist for the Chinese Communist Party. And I'm here to tell you that you can 
believe that they are committing genocide against the Uyghurs and other Muslim populations in their country, and also know that bellicose rhetoric, saber rattling, and trying to, uh, to essentially shoe in US-China economic competition under the guise of democracy versus authoritarian ultimately fuels the very authoritarianism that we're seeing because of that cycle where we're othering and we're pitting different populations against each other. Whereas the reality is, is that we know that because of the policies of both the Chinese government and the US government over the last 30 years, working people, everyday regular people who are just trying to make ends meet, they are the ones who are the worst impacted. And of often it also happens to uh, minority or mar marginalized, uh, historically marginalized populations as well, and they're most impacted. And I think um, the what's terrifying to me, and this is where I think I will end, um, is that uh, what's happening in Washington, the the left, the Democratic Party, if you will, I, they're, what seems to be happening is they're failing to understand the role of, um, uh, of being anti-China has within the far right um, and within na white nationalist circles um, and ultimately with the growing fascist movements that we're seeing prop up across the country, um, in addition to the amount of hate crimes that we're seeing. And if we're not making those connections to how the, our militarism abroad and at home are fueling these forces that believe that they have more rights than other people just based on their identity, then we are setting ourselves up for failure um, and for more conflict, not just between other countries, but internally as well. And so you know, I would propose that a better strategy for the United States, if it truly was concerned about the conditions of the Uyghurs, is that it should mount an international campaign to discredit counterterrorism, that it doesn't work, that it relies on racial profiling and religious profiling. And ultimately, the things that are driving people to violence or seeking other forms of authority besides their government is often due to governance failure, economic collapse, human rights abuses, or other disasters um, that their needs then are not being met by the state. And I think it's always important to bring it back to, um, you know, there are national liberation movements um, all over the world I think in the last five years, we've seen more and more people come out into the streets protesting for their rights. And I, I think that's important that even if um, there is such brutal repression going on, and there has been in China for so long, the reality is, is we should be focusing on how we can empower the social movements, civil society who is leading on the documentation, on the calls for accountability for these types of atrocities, but then also work for structural change to democratize the international system and allow there to actually be avenues towards meaningful justice and accountability for crimes against humanity, which the current system is not up to handling. Okay, um, thank you, Kate. Um, you've raised a, a lot of uh, difficult questions and, and broadened the context uh, for, for our discussion. I know we only have you for another 15 minutes or so, and some of the questions uh, that have been raised are asking for more details about the specific conditions of the Uyghurs, and we can just kind of put that on hold for the moment and uh, focus um, on uh, the language, the voice, the perspective in which we raise these concerns about the conditions of the Uyghurs. Who is allowed to say that? Who's allowed to do that? And um, unfortunately, when we look comparatively and look in other circumstances about uh, minorities that have been uh, poorly treated, repressed, even experienced genocide, the voices and the call to action and the attention is not usually internally generated. It has to come from, from the outside. So it's coming from the outside now, but the voices aren't innocent either. And as you say, they're linked, worst case, to 
right-wing movements, fascist movements, to economic competition between the United States and China. So do you have any further thoughts on how to pose those voices, how to characterize the situation with the Uyghurs in China without it simultaneously lending it to a piling on onto China or using the cudgel of, of China or contributing to the hostility that is mounting between these, between these two countries? I mean, I think the first thing that policymakers should be doing is asking the question of how is this militaristic policy going to actually better the lives of Uyghurs on the ground, right? Like, what's the impact? Because a lot of the proposals in Washington to deal with this problem are, let's create a slush fund at the Department of Defense to um, facilitate more security assistance and weapons transfers in East Asia. That's doing little, um, not only for human rights abuses, but also to like actually de-escalate conflict elsewhere in the region in the South China Sea. Um, I think that uh, part of what happens in Washington is because Democrats for a long time have been very afraid of looking weak on national security, the conversation that we're having is largely framed within um, a militaristic frame that assumes the US has the power and control. It just hasn't enacted enough will to make something change in the world. And that might have been true in the unipolar moment, but I think it's important to understand that there are not only limits to US power, but also limits to what military intervention can actually achieve, especially with regard to human rights. Um, the, the, on, uh, Lucy Marie's question in the chat, I just wanted to, to bring up a little bit because um, I think it's important that absolutely that, you know, for the US to be successful, it has to lead by example, right? And I think um, when I was talking about discrediting counterterrorism, right, that's not only um, talking about its failings, it's also ending the policies that's fueling violence around the world. Um, but I think it's also about thinking through globally are there uh, agendas that have wider buy-in across the world that the US can support um, to de-escalate, I think, the, the bilateral conversation that is happening? Because the US has no credibility to talk about human rights when it comes to China. It, if anything, it is, as Lucy was saying, it's inflaming the government. However, the Chinese government does view the sustainable development goals um, as a non-Western agenda that they, you know, I obviously disagree with any of that government's policies, um, but the reality is, is that the U.S. has done little to actually try to engage with that agenda, which is supported by the majority, particularly by the global south, um, is a critical aspect of actually achieving climate justice um, this century. And so there, there's part of this where we have to walk and chew gum. Part of it is just being truthful about what's going on. It's about naming the fact that our opponents who actually only use human rights for war are yet again trying to get us into a generational conflict so they can distract from the problems we have at home and ultimately solidify their own power. And so this is where I think, um, you know, a, a broad anti-corruption agenda globally is also fundamentally um, uh, a longer term several bullet initiative because all of these regimes, including ours <laughs> in its uh, previous form and somewhat in its current form, um, we have a corruption problem. We have a white global elite corruption problem and that ultimately is feeding the cycle of impunity that we're seeing that basically is has come down to the point of if the US does it, then I have a free check to do it. And that's the very same thing that's happened on CT. Mm -hmm. Alkin uh, Gardner, do you have any thoughts yourself? I mean, you've both spoken very movingly about the plight of the Uyghur population in China. And I also have a suspicion that you don't want to lend that kind of, use that information, have it be used in a way that is um, uh, advancing the prospect or multiplying the prospect for war between the United States and China, where there's some alarming trends. So how can we dissociate an honest, transparent discussion of what's going on with the Uyghur population from the broader trend of growing hostilities. 
<laughs> I'd love to speak. Go on. Um, and I would say um, that I've participated in a number of such panels, and I'm very, very impressed with the engagement and the strong views of many of the people who've sent in questions and comments. Uh, Alexander Close asked, where are the Uyghur voices? There are no Uyghurs speaking on this panel. That's an oversight. Uh, I have participated in many panels where Uyghur friends and colleagues have done so. They've spoken very movingly. Uh, I'm trying to reflect things I've learned from them on another panel. It'd be great to have one of them instead of me. I don't deny that at all. I, I want to push back against the suggestion by several people that to speak critically about these policies and the plight of Uyghurs is somehow in itself necessarily to endorse the bellicose policy of the United States. Uh, I thought Kate made really nice points about where the proper levers are and what are the, the not only the less risky, but the wiser strategies long-term. But I think to decide that any criticism of Uyghurs is being weaponized for an anti-China faction of policymakers is incredibly naive. And the alternative then is to stick one's head in the sand and say, oh, I don't want war between China and the United States. Ergo, I will not say anything about Uyghurs, which I think would be ridiculous. And I hope no one here is suggesting that, right? Um, so a number of people have asked very quickly about whether Adrian Zenz, who is an extraordinary scholar, by the way, and others are the best sources of information, whether their methods are flawed. What we have here, let's be honest, and again, I am in no way endorsing an anti-China policy or war with China. But let's be honest, Beijing, the Communist Party is incredibly dishonest about what it's been doing and why and what its ultimate intentions are. Tell me that you can understand how Beijing imagines the end game after throwing 1.8 million people into these camps, mostly as Al-Qaeda has pointed out, for the crime of being Muslim and speaking Uyghur and wearing beards, right? Um, it's not comprehensible by any rational policy making analysis. Right. So because Beijing has been so, shall we say, economical with information about what it's doing, the people who've studied it have had to be incredibly innovative. Adrian Zenz deserves enormous credit for his incredible innovations in finding various sources of information. I will talk about later because I want to make sure Kate gets one more chance to speak. Uh, and I'm sure I'll kind of have things to say about this as well. The last thing I will say is that uh, one of you mentioned uh, the funding for the training of Tibetan warriors in Colorado back in the 1960s. And there's a, actually a great book called Orphans of the Cold War by a former CIA um, operative, uh, Ken Knaus. Really, really good book. I highly recommend. Um, the United States has, even before 1949, been involved in what we might call harassment of Chinese communists, uh, particularly by um, trying to poke at relations with minorities. So this is a very old story, right? But none of us, by participating here and by speaking critically about what is an, a deplorable situation, whatever we call it, genocide or others, is somehow ipso facto endorsing policies uh, of war making or very simplistic ideas of which levers might improve the situation of Uyghurs. Many of the levers that people are proposing would, I agree, probably worsen the situation for Uyghurs by making Beijing more stubborn. Sorry to go on at such great length, but I think this is no, really right. important. You're doing fine. Alkan? Uh, I'll just briefly follow up. Uh, I think uh, it's reasonable to say that China poses a twofold problem in terms of human rights. And uh, the first one is China has been perpetrating uh, various forms of large scale human rights violations uh, frequently and with impunity. And the second is uh, this impunity, uh, especially when combined with uh, China's efforts to uh, undermine and challenge the global uh, human rights norms and values, it's kind of also ha have having an effect on human rights uh, system as well. That said, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's probably uh, reasonable to say that unilateral actions by individual states might not necessarily uh, contribute too much to a lasting accountability of China. Instead, I think we should channel significant energy to defending and reinvigorating the uh, international system, uh, including the United Nations and Human Rights Council. And I think, uh, therefore, it's important to note, to note that we need to work in um, coalition with other countries, uh, we should work in partnership with those uh, 
non-traditional allies, especially uh, those from the global south. Uh, the bottom line is we need to make it more difficult for China to dismiss calls for uh, human rights accountability uh, as politically motivated actions between uh, it's designed to protect the Western power against its rise. Uh, as long as the response to China remains uh, divided between the West and the rest, uh, China will continue to effectively thwart these uh, efforts because it's very adept at exploiting these sorts of divisions. Uh, thanks. Okay. Kate, I know you're, you've got two, three minutes before you depart. Any final thoughts? I think my final thought is that, um, you know, in a globalized world, we may hate what the U.S. is doing, but its actions still matter, right? And, um, you know, I think uh, I've talked to um, many members of Muslim American communities um, here in the States about this challenge and, um, you know, whether or not they're feeling solidarity with progressives in the United States who call for human rights and things like that. And I think one of the challenges that needs to be talked about is that part of the problem here is US policy, particularly since 9-11, really reinforced, double down, legitimized Islamophobia globally. Um, and that has become a tool, not only in China, but in places like India and elsewhere to violently repress its Muslim um, populations. And I just want to remind folks, um, you know, of the saying that, uh, you know, they came, they came for one of us and I didn't do anything, but then eventually they came for me. And that's how this works. What it's not necessarily that authoritarians are coordinating around the world, but it's that they're using similar tactics as Alkan was saying to solidify their power, right? And I think this is where, focusing on how U.S. actions are driving this type of violence, what actions we can take to prevent it, but also hold ourselves accountable to create justification for others to do the same is the critical steps that we're not seeing Washington willing to take. Um, but thank you for having me. I really appreciate all of you. Right. Many thanks for your contributions, Kate. Look forward to working together in the future. Thanks for participating. Take care. Bye. Um, I'm looking at a couple of the questions, uh, Q and A, uh, looking, asking for a little bit more detail from the uh, initial, uh, presentation. One of them was on, um, education in, um, the Uyghur areas and the distinction between primary education and then secondary, which was in, in, um, original language and then high school and college language going towards, um, towards Chinese language, towards Mandarin. Um, uh, further details on that, either one of you? Maybe I can briefly mention a few things and then Gardner can uh, follow up. Um, we, uh, I have uh, conducted a research on the situation of uh, uh, separated Uyghur families uh, the year before. Uh, and apparently, I mean, obviously the uh, this mass internment campaign, uh, the, the mass internment uh, has various effects on uh, the society, uh, not only on those people who had been detained in these facilities, but also the rest of the community in the region, as well as uh, their families and relatives, uh, some of uh, whom uh, are living abroad. And um, basically, uh, in 2016, some uh, Uyghurs, they have uh, heard that uh, there was this uh, new regulation that their passports would be uh, confiscated by the police. And they, that's why most of them, they it tried to flee the country uh, and they weren't able to leave some of their children that they weren't able to bring some of their children along with them and therefore had to leave them at the care of their some of their relatives and we were able to speak these uh, parents and uh, according to their testimonies uh, 
most of these children who were uh, made to uh, stay in orphanages uh, or kindergartens were not allowed to speak in uh, Mandarin at all, uh, in China, in Uyghur at all. They were always, uh, they had to speak in Mandarin. And on top of this, they were not allowed to speak with their uh, parents. Uh, and uh, obviously the curriculum uh, of the, uh, these facilities included heavily uh, influenced uh, like propaganda uh, materials, uh, which probably is not unique to Xinjiang, but also across the country as well. Uh, so uh, we see that there is often, uh, apart from this, there is also uh, other elements uh, in, in terms of like uh, the pressure of speaking in Uyghur in the region is uh, even increasing. Uh, and uh, apart from this, uh, uh, there were also several reports of uh, those uh, children who speak in other languages than Mandarin having been having been have to uh, write self criticism letters where they they are saying that they have made a mistake by speaking in their mother tongue, and they wouldn't do the same mistake again. Uh, that's uh, more or less uh, what we have. Uh, in, in, the, in our report, over to Gardner. Okay, Gardner, you're muted, just to make sure. Yes, uh, so uh, thank you, Akan, that was really excellent. And um, to be clear, you are talking, as you said you would, about really the compulsory linguistic assimilation by means of essentially silencing Uyghur. Um, inside the camps uh, in the contemporary period. And what I was trying to do with my initial context setting presentation was to talk about the history of the policies. And I'm happy to go back and do that. I would like to point out that a lot of people here seem to think that because the United States is a bad actor, um, it is either illegitimate for us to criticize or we ought to be doing something better with our time. And again, I disagree. I will say the United States has been an extraordinarily bad actor in a number of ways, right? Still reckoning with the colonization of the United States, the marginalization and the near uh, uh, genocide toward Native Americans, and of course the forcible uh, enslavement of many, many people from Africa. These are uh, terrible blots on American history. They should be reckoned with. That does not deprive us of voice to critique. On the same token, right, the United States does not have a credible record when it comes to uh, multilingual education, right? Um, I I'm sure Alcan can testify that in his home country, there was an expectation that people would be multilingual. In the United States, there's an expectation that people will speak English and nothing else matters. I talked about an early commitment, which was a creditable commitment um, of the Chinese to allowing Tibetans and Uyghurs and others to use their native languages. It was written into the constitutions. There were several of them. It was copied from the Soviet Union, which also had this model. Unfortunately, in both the case of the Soviet Union and in China, there was a simultaneous emphasis on um, teaching everyone the national language. It was much less strong in China early on than it had been in the Soviet Union. Okay, up until 2000, there were Uyghur language courses in the universities in Xinjiang and Kazakh language and so forth. After 2000, the only subjects one could study in Uyghur or Kazakh and so forth in college were literature courses in those languages, okay? Uh, I thought that was pretty outrageous given the constitution. In subsequent years, the Uyghur language and Kazakh language and even bilingual schools were slowly closed down until there are none left. All the schools now are Mandarin only, okay? Unless there are the very occasional classes in another language uh, as a sort of side project, okay? So this forcible linguistic assimilation now, which is very clearly part of a plan to make Uyghurs and others think in Chinese and feel loyalty, loyalty to the party and to China in Chinese, is part of a longer term trajectory of abandoning the former goal of recognizing and indeed supporting linguistic and other forms of cultural diversity. Right? So it is a sad coda to what was initially a program that actually would have been worth studied by the United States and other governments. Thanks. Is there a, a, a useful forum, you know, if, it, if, if we want to try to avoid a situation where the United States is pointing its finger in, in 
a hypocritical manner, you know, um, uh, not only hip hypocritical, but also in a way that is uh, lending itself towards uh, mounting war cloud clouds. But uh, we don't want to put our head in the sand either, as you say. Is there a useful forum, uh, a, a strategy for intervening in this to deepen the voice of concern? Um, uh, is it something that should be coupled with a discussion of the status of the Rohingya in Myanmar um, at, at, the, at the same time, or with um, Guantanamo Bay? Um, um, what was what's an effective way of intervening in this that is not ratcheting up the existing tensions? What would that look like? Cole Harrison had a useful question about that in the chat. Your thoughts? Amnesty International in every living room. Um, I mean, Amnesty, just to kind of push further on this, I know Amnesty has, over the last decade, thought we not only have to investigate particular situations, but we also have to look at the policies behind the the uh, the creation of those circumstances that we're that we're that we're looking at. Um, how has Amnesty really tried to think about ways in which it could, in uh, a compassionate voice, an effective voice, what's not tied to governments? more human, humanitarian concern, deepen the concern for human rights abuses. What's effective in this context? Uh, that's a great question, Paul, and uh, our listener as well. You um, don't have to worry, you've got 23 minutes to answer. I think uh, we have already have an established system uh, that is designed to uh, improve the, the situations of human rights in across the world. And I think we should therefore make use of this system uh, to the extent possible uh, to strengthen it. Uh, unfortunately, there are uh, some aspects that are, uh, to some extent, we see that, uh, for example, for the situation in Xinjiang, we have been asking not only Amnesty International, but also the Office of uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights has been asking for immediate, meaningful, and unfettered access to, uh, to Xinjiang for uh, an impartial, independent, international investigation on what is happening in the region. And the Chinese government has been denying this meaningful access for the last three years. Uh, and uh, we see that there has been a number of joint letters uh, in terms of uh, expressing the concerns and uh, criticism of uh, the human rights violations that are taking place in the region, uh, signed by a number of mainly like-minded states like uh, Western countries. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we see that uh, right after one day or two days, there is a, uh, a response from uh, mostly led by Cuba or Belarus or uh, similar countries that are China's allies uh, that are uh, mainly used to, at least in the past, uh, saying that uh, they are uh, supporting the policies of China in the region. Uh, in effort to uh, fight terrorism or whatsoever. Uh, but we see that there is also a changing pattern in these uh, competing joint letters. Recently, there has been, uh, at least the language has uh, changed uh, much more than before, basically saying that uh, instead of supporting those policies in the region, they are now saying that, uh, well, we shouldn't interfere interfere within uh, uh, in internal affairs of China. Um, so, what is the most ideal uh, or effective method? Is we need to have a unified uh, reaction and uh, to 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 address the situation on the ground and to to the Chinese government. I think the Chinese government cares about its international reputation a lot 
uh, we have seen various responses from its diplomats and state media uh, as well. Uh, what people describe as wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, this is a manifestation of how much they care about their, uh, uh, their in Chinese means, uh, their prestige, their face. Uh, and I think we should make use of that. We should uh, definitely uh, maintain the pressure and to the extent that uh, they should allow an investigation uh, and uh, I think this is probably the uh, one of the uh, effective methods we can we should make use of. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I love that answer, Elkan, and uh, I hold your organization and your work in enormous regard. Uh, it's thankless work. It's very difficult, and there are always questions, as many of the um, challenges in the chat have pointed out. Always questions about the chain of evidence, the reliability of people have reported and so forth. A number of people seemed to be flummoxed that there might have been so many people uh, who successfully left to tell their tales. And I wanna suggest um, it is puzzling. I've already admitted that I do not understand how Beijing imagines the end game of the policies, okay? I cannot comprehend them and I've been studying this place for 30 years, okay? But I will say this. I've suggested following the work of Adrian Zenz and others that there may be as many as 1.8 million, maybe uh, more like 1.5 million, still an extraordinary number of Turkic Muslims, mostly Uyghurs in the camps. We're talking about not millions, not thousands, maybe hundreds of people who've escaped to tell their tales in Central Asia and elsewhere, okay? I have personal acquaintances who've escaped and told me their stories. I have, unfortunately, many other friends who have not escaped, who are still inside, uh, esteemed academics, presidents of universities, and so forth. It's, it's extraordinary. Okay. So um, I am persuaded as a scholar who knows many of the people and who has in, in, uh, interviewed many of the people who've provided these stories, that these are scrupulous folks who care only about getting at the truth and revealing horrible human rights abuse without regard to the question of whether it might be misused by others. If asked, they'll tell you what they advise and what they wouldn't advise, okay? So uh, human rights organizations try to keep human rights abuses on people's radar so that they might put pressure on governments. I think that's important, right? Democratic governments should actually listen to what their citizens say. Unfortunately, most citizens uh, place uh, human rights abuses abroad, about number 117 on their list of things to do with re respect to their government. The other thing I would recommend is citizen to citizen contacts, right? When it's possible traveling to or speaking with citizens of China about what's actually going on. This is super important. Persuading some people through calm conversation could be as effective as many of the other things we're talking about. It starts small and has to accumulate. But one thing I would point out, and a number of people have made this point already, it begins with checking our priors. Yes, the United States and many other states, including Turkey, as Alkan undoubtedly know, have perpetrated horrible human rights abuses. And any citizen or any government that starts by saying, we are spotless, we're gonna throw stones, is ridiculous, it's a non-starter. So starting by saying, let's talk about bad behavior in various states. Let's talk about how citizens of the world might develop a discourse and a set of norms that would pressure governments, including our own to change behavior, right? These start small, they are very tiny levers, but they're really, really important. And they don't involve warmongering and endorsing policies, uh, warmongering policies or the military industrial complex. Okay. Just wanted to uh, follow up with a few more sentences. I mean, uh, I think it's also important to note that warmongering policies and especially wars have catastrophic impacts also uh, on those survivors or victims of those human rights violations uh, as well, uh, which is quite uh, counterproductive uh, in general. Uh, this also includes various other policies, but mainly uh, when we try to ameliorate a situation or improve the human rights of uh, certain people, uh, we should definitely avoid at all costs harming them further. Thanks. Right. Um, 
one thing we haven't really talked about so far is really any of the uh, economic considerations that might be lying behind this. So I wonder if you could um, both of you um, mention or, or delve into that a bit. I've 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 read something. I can't I can't say it's fully substantiated about uh, labor conditions. Uh, Uyghurs in China producing textiles under uh, quote slave or quote, close to slave like conditions. Uh, some of that textiles we exported, and it raises the question of um, you know conscious consumerism. Um, the possibility of choking things off in, in, in that direction. But for, can I ask first, what you know about um, the uh, conditions for textile production using Uyghur labor in, in, uh, in China and whether that is a particular cause of concern? Um, we have interviewed a number of uh, detainees who were released from these facilities. Uh, and they were subjected to some form of uh, forced labor in uh, some, particularly the, the main pattern was government institutions, including the, uh, including these uh, internment camps where these detainees uh, were made to uh, work uh, uh, to, uh, forcibly, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 we haven't uh, gathered uh, like enough evidence to indicate particular industry or particular uh, brands uh, that might uh, be involved in this uh, uh, forced labor uh, allegations. But uh, I think it's important to 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 note that all the companies who operate in the region, uh, as well as uh, who have supply chains in the region, they are responsible to, for conducting human rights due diligence of their activities in the region, whether their activities has any negative impact uh, in terms of human rights. Uh, and uh, they need to uh, publish their human rights due diligence report. Uh, and this is uh, very well described and stated under the United Nations guiding principles uh, for business human rights. And uh, therefore, uh, the situation in the, on the ground uh, is a bit tricky in, when it comes to conducting human rights due diligence because uh, getting information out of the region is extremely difficult. Also, the informational channels are heavily influenced by the government. Uh, when you have only uh, government-run trade unions, how can you trust uh, the information you receive from these uh, institutions? Uh, uh, we know that there are no mechanisms for grave grievances uh, uh, like even the mechanisms that are established are all, they all report to all China uh, Federation of Trade Unions, which is a state-run institution. So uh, therefore we uh, say that until they can, the companies or uh, investors or sponsors, uh, they can conduct a meaningful uh, human rights due diligence report uh, and get transparent information, it's important to uh, maybe pause their operations uh, and try to get uh, until they can get a transparent and meaningful information from the region, whether their operations has uh, like not any negative impacts on the ground. Thanks. Okay. Uh, th th these webinars are very awkward and when you're trying to have a a full-fledged debate and a lot of participants, I, I would just call attention to the post by Jenny in the Q&A where she references a report that's skeptical of the claim that there's widespread uh, mistreatment and, 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 and forced labor. So I don't think uh, we would say that's the end of the discussion, but it is something to consider. Um, to make sure that the claims are, are substantiated. So 
there is a piece here from Jenny that you might want to refer to. Maybe just a quick note on that. I mean, uh, there was a leaked government document uh, that is for uh, how a, a, a guidance for employing Uyghurs, uh, Uyghur workers in Guangdong province, mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, describing the details where they should be staying uh, and how their uh, work and life should be organized by the employers and various kinds of guidelines on uh, uh, those uh, only for Uyghur people uh, in the Guangdong province, not for other 55 ethnic minorities. Uh, it's also an important, uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to take note of these as well. Okay. Gardner? And Alcon, I thought that was a masterful and very comprehensive review of what we know and the reasons we might not know how accurate it is, right? And again, this is always a problem if one is trying to establish bad behavior whose perpetrators are allergic to light. And let it be said, something that many of us know already, which is that unfortunately, uh, textile production around the world is a pretty sad story because the yeah. margins are so thin, right? If you look right. at Bangladesh, right, which has built its economy substantially on textile production, the right. stories are hideous and that, you know, the factory fires and so forth are awful. Uh, and that isn't because Bangladeshi entrepreneurs are uniquely bad. It's because it's so hard to make a buck in that business. I will say this, uh, there's a very long story uh, about the economics of running Xinjiang uh, in various phases. Um, too long to tell here, I will say the great historian at Georgetown, uh, James Millward, has written several books about this. His first book, Beyond the Pass, which is about Qing Empire in Xinjiang, and his more comprehensive book that brings us up to the present called Eurasian Crossroads. Both of them are excellent. And because of his own training, he has a special eye for the economics of running a colony, a neo-colony, internal colony, wherever we want to talk about it. But in, in brief, the challenge facing Beijing is in a huge country that's highly populated, Xinjiang is one sixth of the territory with only 25 million people in it. It is too arid uh, and the water table is falling fast to increase the population very much. So how to extract enough resources from it to make it worth the candle? Well, one answer is oil in the place and from the pipelines, right? Another problem though, is how to keep enough Han Chinese there gainfully employed uh, that there isn't a worry about a mass exodus of Hans into China's interior as actually happened uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, right? That hasn't been talked about here today, but that's an important part of this story, right? So um, the government is concerned, of course, to employ people. It wants Uyghurs to have a rising standard of living in the hope that maybe they'll stop being angry and Hans who've moved there to stay in the hopes that they'll be, um, that they will be able to sustain themselves, right? Inside the camps, there's all the question of how you can pay for all this uh, and how you can provide some kind of evidence for the rationale that these are job training camps, as was adverted to earlier. One of the ways you do that is you employ people, right? The problem is the mode and the remuneration for the employment. Alcon mentioned leaked documents. Oftentimes the best evidence we have of what is intended and what's really going on is these rare documents that come out that show intentionality that show full recognition from Beijing of how exploitative the circumstances of employment are. So I agree we should all be skeptical, but very scrupulous people have been working very hard to put together a record that I find very compelling. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we're nearing the end of our time. I just would give each of you an opportunity to have some final thoughts. Thanks, Paul. Uh, well, uh, I'll briefly- Not easy, uh, I know. Uh, I'll briefly uh, address one of the questions uh, asking about what is happening to these people after uh, like yeah. they, they get released. I think I'll, uh, it's an important question. Most of the detained people are not released or there are three categories and most of the people we were able to interview are less secure from less secure detention facilities or internment camps. So we, we, we don't know what is happening on the more secure uh, internment camps. And 
what we hear is that according to other detainees, that most of them are taken to prisons, especially those who are uh, related to religious uh, so-called crimes or mistakes. Um, I think uh, I, I, I will repeat uh, what I said earlier. I think it's, uh, I want to finish uh, with saying that it's when we try to protect people, we should uh, make sure that we don't harm them further. We don't have uh, any uh, more, uh, uh, we don't do take no any, harm. yes, yeah. do no harm. This is the main principle, I think. Uh, this also includes uh, sanctions on particular regions or particular people, like where they will lose their jobs when they are, you are trying to also like uh, uh, protect their rights. I think it's a very tricky balance, but I think uh, do no harm is the main principle, including uh, for uh, warmongering policies and otherwise as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Gordon? Uh, and I would say, uh, first of all, there have been a number of really great questions and great interventions, and I'm really pleased to serve on this panel with Elkan and Kate, uh, ably moderated by you, Paul, with some great questions of your own. Um, ordinarily, when I participate in such events, let's say informational events about the situation in Xinjiang, East Turkestan, um, I worry about uh, misuse of the findings of the panels. I worry that militarists are going to go and try to use these to pressure the United States to put pressure on China. Ironically, I have the opposite problem here. I have the sense of the room that a lot of people are worried that even talking about this will either be itself an endorsement or lead to endorsement of US militarism. That's not my purpose here. Um, and, uh, particular set of questions that I have not been able to answer, we have not been able to answer, what to do, how to help Uyghurs and so forth, why aren't there more Uyghur voices? These are all really important questions. If you're interested, in Washington DC there's an organization called the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Uh, some people I know very well have been working there for years. Contact them and ask them what you can do, right? There are Uyghur transnational organizations. There are also human rights organizations that are engaged in larger versions of these issues caring deeply about Uyghurs and others and Tibetans, as has been mentioned. Um, in the end, I guess I wanna say, there are many possible levers, many of them bad, and we've just talked about the Hippocratic principle of first doing no harm, right? Lots and lots of policies have obvious bad consequences, right? Let's begin by trying to understand the conditions of people elsewhere in the world and do that not by imagining what they're going through, but by going to them and talking to them or talking to people who've talked to them, right? That's why this is an important exercise, right? Um, and if we learn more and we find the people make plausible charges and the conditions are truly horrific, then if there's some way we can find to persuade someone to put pressure that might reduce those conditions, that's a good thing to do. Let's not presume that sanctions or warmongering something else is the tool that does that. And let's keep in mind always that certain kinds of pressure might backfire and leave the people who are already in terrible conditions worse off, right? So these are my concerns as well. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to participate in this discussion on this excellent right. panel. Uh, and I'm sorry that I wasn't able to answer more questions or answer them more satisfactorily. Well, the final voice of appreciation is really my, mine. So thank you, Alkin, and thank you, Gardner. Thank you, Kate and Absentia, for participating and contributing your expertise. I thought it was a wonderful session. Thank you, um, participants, for joining us for this 90-minute uh, discussion, this webinar. Um, I think you, you might have seen the post that a recording will be put on the uh, SANE US China policy website shortly and it'll be widely available for our, anyone who wants to, uh, to consult it. Thank you. Um, we are in a difficult situation with this issue or a difficult situation in many ways in this world, but it's, it's reassuring to know that there are people like you who are helping us think it through. Good night all. Take care. Good night. Well, very